Happy Monday, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Depending on where you are in the world today, it might be Monday morning, Monday afternoon, Monday evening. Um, but regardless, we are so, so happy to see you. Now, my name is Meg Alexander. I am part of Power to Fly's virtual hosting team. And I am, as always, incredibly excited and honored to get to host another Power to Fly virtual event. Now, before we dive in uh, and introduce you to our speaker today, I want to go over a couple quick housekeeping items, especially important if maybe this is your first Power to Fly event. If that is the case, then hi, welcome. We're so happy to meet you. Now, don't worry, I still have plenty of love for my, our frequent flyers. We are always happy to see returning faces and uh, you know familiar avatars. So thank you all for joining us as well. Now, um, throughout this upcoming conversation, our, uh, our goal is to encourage y'all to participate as much as you would like to. You can do this in a couple different ways. You can turn your cameras on if you'd like. Um, you can come on, you can turn, uh, sorry, turn your cameras on if you'd like to share with us, but truly y'all no need to be Instagram perfect. Honestly, we don't care if you are in a three piece suit or your bathrobe. We just want to meet you where you are. So please feel free to turn on cameras if you'd like, but no pressure. All right. If you don't want to participate with your camera, you can always participate in the group chat. So feel free to send in questions or comments in there. Maybe you want to add a little more context to a question that you asked or you want our speaker to dive in a little bit deeper on a topic, um, a term, you know, piece of terminology, whatever it is. Um, so please feel free to, to have that chat active and hopping. And I just wanna call out here in case anybody would like to, uh, to get the chat moving. Um, let us know where you're joining us from in the world. Um, I am coming to you from Toledo, Ohio. This is land that belongs to the Fox, Kickapoo and Potawatomi tribes in my area. So um, please feel free to let us know where you're joining us from. And if you know whose land you're on, now, um, the one thing I do want to encourage y'all is that as we're in that chat, you know, um, networking with our fellow attendees and really getting to know each other and sharing and learning from each other, um, just make sure that as always, we lead from a place of kindness and respect. Now, um, the good thing about today's session is we are live streaming as well as recording. So hi, you two. Um, so what that means for all of you is you don't have to take notes. You get to kick back, relax, and enjoy the conversation that Royden and I are about to have. Now. Everybody that registered for today's event, whether you stay for the full five, the full 60 minutes, you only jump in and out, or maybe you're not able to make it today on time, that's okay. Um, everybody's going to get an email from Powerfly in about four to five business days, and it's going to have a link to where you can rewatch this recording once it's posted to our website. Now, let's say that Royden says something today so unbelievably mind-blowing that you cannot wait four to five business days to share this with a friend or a coworker or a relative. You don't have to, you can always head over to our YouTube channel. I'll be sharing links for all of this in the chat as we go through today's event, but you can head over to our YouTube channel um, where we're live streaming. The post uh, or the video is usually posted by the end of the business day. And um, you can search a whole huge section of our recorded chats, our big archive. Um, you can search that right from uh, our Power to Fly uh, YouTube channel. Now, obviously, I recommend that you check out our website because that's where the full archive is. So all kinds of free resources that we would love to share with all of you. Now, um, like I said, so today we are doing the recording, so you don't have to worry about if you miss anything. But again, any questions or comments you have, please feel free to share those in the chat. I'm always really, really happy to, uh, to raise whatever questions or comments you have to the speaker. Now, if you have questions or comments that you would like to uh, you know, be made, but you want to be kept anonymous, not a problem. Just DM anything to me, Meg Alexander. You'll find my name in the drop down as opposed to sending it to everyone in the group chat. All right, y'all. Um, last but not least, I'm very excited to introduce you to today's speaker. Now, Royden Jeffrey is the co-founder and CEO at Listed B, which uh, Royden is a deep thinker who loves to engage in thought-provoking conversations. He has a strong interest in business, technology, beauty services, as well as psychology. Royden is a fast learner, solution-oriented, and production, sorry, yeah, production-focused individual who never forgets the importance of remaining a constant student. Royden, welcome to the stage. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Is there anything else that you think our audience should know about you before we get started? Um, I think this is pretty fine. Um, yeah, I'm just interested in having the conversation, answering questions. Um, but yeah, this is fine. Um, I'm based here in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, yeah. Excellent. We love to see, uh, oh, sorry, there we go. There's your spotlight. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. We love finding out where all our people are hailed from today. So thank you so much. I do see we've got people chiming in in the chat. 
Um, people coming in here from New Jersey, Pakistan, Mumbai, Raleigh. Love, love, love it. Oh, and thank you so much, Mariah, for sharing whose land you're on. Um, all right. So we got some really great questions um, in advance of today's event. So like I said earlier, if you, um, if you are unsure, if we're going to get to your question, ask it in the chat. If you are, um, if you, you know, maybe you asked a question and we're tackling it, but we're maybe not coming at it from the right direction. Let us know if you have some more content or more context that you'd like to give us more information, whatever you'd like. Um, ask early, ask often. Uh, that's going to be the best way to make sure that you get your questions answered today. All right, so let's start with kind of the, the ground, uh, you know, base level and like kind of level set for everybody. When we're talking about a mobile developer, what does that person do? <clears throat> okay, so as a mobile developer from my personal experience, um, so what they do is they work on mobile applications and that's either for the iPhone or for Android or the two primary smartphones that we have in our society today. Um, specifically, I was um, an iPhone um, developer. So I specifically only focus on iOS. Um, I don't know anything about Android. Um, yeah, and I started off with Objective-C, which was the original um, programming language that Apple created for mobile development. And then um, in 20, 2014, I believe, they came out with Swift which is supposed to be a replacement of, of Objective-C. Objective-C is still used a lot today, um, but it's not as um, proficient and it's not as popular as Swift. Swift has now became the dominant and the more um, go-to language that people use for mobile development for specifically for the, um, the iOS ecosystem. Um, so yeah, I started off with Objective-C, but I hated Objective-C, hated everything about it. The syntax and just the look of it was terrible. And pretty much that's why they created Swift, right? It was supposed to be faster, safer, uh, more um, user-friendly, um, better syntax and better design and everything. Everything that you can think of, think of that would make a language better, Swift was designed specifically for that. So, um, so yeah, so that's um, where I was with iOS development. Very cool, all right. Um, let's talk about what your journey was like to get to um, mobile development. How, how long did it take you and what, you know, what was that journey like for you? Um, so, yeah, my journey was pretty unique and unprecedented. So pretty much I stumbled into tech by accident, right? I had no prior experience to tech or programming. I, I've never even heard the word computer programming before or coding or software engineer never knew those terms before ever. No one in my friends group or anyone that in my environment spoke about those things. Like I've never exposed to those things. I, I hated computers. I didn't even like computers, right? Um, and it wasn't until I graduated college, um, I got my degree in accounting, um, but it wasn't panning out so well for me. And um, like, I think my last year for, um, before I got my degree, I started to hate accounting. I'm like, man, this is so boring. I can't believe I spent four years pursuing this um, this degree and I don't even want to do it anymore. I can't see myself working for the rest of my career doing something like this. So after I graduated, I took the whole summer just to relax and to like, just think and try to figure out like, okay, what is my life going to look like? And then um, I read a book. Um, uh, I think it was Rich Dad, Poor Dad and Think and Grow Rich. And when I read Think and Grow Rich, um, in the book, it mentioned about finding your purpose and what you want to do in life, right? And somehow, I think at the time, so this was around, I graduated 2014. So this was the time when um, Snapchat had recently came out and it was super popular, right? Everyone was download, downloading Snapchat, everyone talking about it. And that's when I got the idea like, oh, I should learn how to build an app. Like I get, I have a lot of cool ideas, I think. Um, that I can turn into an app, but I had no idea where to start, how to begin, what do you do when you want to build an app? Like, yeah, I had no idea. I've never even thought about it before. Like, I've used so many apps in my life, but never thought about, okay, how did they make this or what's happening behind the scenes? Those things never occurred to me. And then I was on Facebook one day after I read the book and I just, I got the idea that maybe I should learn how to build apps. I was on Facebook. And then I saw a post saying that Facebook is coming to New York for an app monetization event at General Assembly. 
right? At the time, I had no idea what General Assembly was, never heard of it before. I didn't even know what the term app monetization meant. All I saw in the description was app. And I remember I, I want to build apps. So I'm like, okay, maybe I should go and check this out. And it was a free event. So I'm like, okay, cool. So I definitely, I went down to Manhattan. I'm based in Brooklyn. So I went over to Manhattan, went to the event, complete, um, like Latin. I didn't understand a single word in the entire event. I was so confused. And then afterwards, um, I walked up to this random person. I was like, hey, man, I'm really interested in learning how to build apps. Um, but I have no idea what was said in this event today. And I'm, I know that I'm curious and I want to learn more. So he said, okay, what I could do for you is general. So apparently I didn't even know this. He was an employee at General Assembly at the time. So he told me that General Assembly offers um, a free online course. I think it's called Dash. I'm not even sure if they still offer that right at this moment. Um, but at the time they had a free online course, which is supposed to be like a teaser or like a, like just to get your feet wet, just to test it out. So he was like, yeah, we have a free trial online. Go test it out, play around with it. And if you like it, reach out to me and let me know what you think. And then we'll see where we can go from there. So he gave it to me. And I believe in like the next two weeks, I got back to him like, hey, man, I checked it out. It's super dope. I think I'm in love and I want to do this. And he was like, wow. I can't tell you how many people reach out to me saying that they want to get into programming and software engineering and coding and all these things. And I give them this website and not a single person has ever reached back out to me. You're the first person that ever came back to me. And I get a ton of these all the time. And he said, I'm going to do whatever I can in my powers to ensure that you get into this program. Um, and yeah, so it was really just all my drive. Um, Fortunately for me, he worked at General Assembly, which I, I didn't know at the time. So then he connected me with the, um, the recruitment department and everything. Um, they walked me through the entire process, telling me that there's loans. There's also scholarships for um, underrepresented people if, if needed. Um, yeah, and I just applied, did the interview, um, was accepted. I got into the program. So I did General Assemblies. I don't even think it's called the WDI no more, which stands for Web Development Immersive at the time. So this was 2015, right? Um, so I did that and halfway into the course, I remember I was saying to my friend like, yo, I'm so excited. I'm so happy that I took this course. Like I can't wait to start building apps. And then he said to me, no, um, well, what we're doing, they don't teach you how to build apps. So I was like, wait, what do you mean? This was the whole purpose of me coming here and being in this program. I'm like, what do you mean they don't teach you how to build apps? He said, no, it's web development immersives. Web development means website. We're learning how to build websites, which is completely different from apps. So I'm like, oh, damn, I'm in the wrong class. Oh. I had no idea. Yeah, it was, it was bizarre. It, it was crazy. So apparently I was in the wrong class. Unfortunately, General Assembly was, was not offering mobile development at the time. Mm -hmm. I, so once I realized that I was still passionate about making apps, so I was like, okay, I already learned the fundamentals. We're halfway through, so I'm starting to pick up a couple of things. I was the, I was the least experienced person when it comes to computers and programming and everything. So I had so much catching up to do in terms of like my peers, but mm -hmm. I had a really great group that was very supportive, very understanding, and always wanted to help me. So I took advantage of that. If anything, I felt like I had the upper hand compared to everyone else because I can soak everything up from you, but I can't really offer anything in return. So I felt like I had the advantage there. So I was like, okay, I'm starting to learn a lot. I feel like, okay, once you have the fundamental, then you can pick up other languages. So that's when I started doing the research. And then I learned about Objective-C. Like, oh, if you want to learn how to build mobile apps, you can, especially for iPhones, you use Objective-C. So I started teaching myself Objective-C while still doing the class because I was like, okay, I'm not a quitter and um, I'm already halfway through. I have to finish this thing, right? Um, so I was so pretty much I was doing the rest of the class while also teaching myself mobile development on the side in my spare time, which I pretty much didn't really have much spare time because General mm -hmm. Assembly was very, very intense. I believe yeah. we were there from eight o'clock in the morning to 9 p.m. at night most times. But most days I would stay until 12. 
because the, the cutoff was 12. So I was there from eight in the morning to 12 at night every single day. So I barely got any sleep, right? Um, but I still try to find time in the evening or on weekends to learn as much as I can about um, mobile development. Uh, but yeah, so that's pretty much how I got into it. And then once the class was over, I wanted to use the new skills that I developed. So for General Assembly, everyone have to submit a final project at the end to help with um, finding a, a job at the, to, at the end of it. You know? So for my final project, I was the only one that came in with a mobile app and everyone else had a website. So immediately I stood out from the crowd because I'm the only one with something different. It's something that wasn't even taught during class. So like immediately that, that gave me like a, a edge in, in the sense over everyone. And it was just fantastic. Everyone was so excited. They wanted to come and play with my app. I don't know. So pretty much what I built was, um, I don't know if you guys are old enough or if you guys remember um, Flappy Bird. Mm -hmm. um, the, yeah, so pretty much I did a clone of Flappy Bird, but I called it Snappy Fish. So instead of a bird, it was a fish, it was underwater, but the concept is still the same. And yeah. everyone was so excited about it. They couldn't stop playing it. There were, some of them were getting addicted to it. Like, oh my God, I love it. I can't, I want to try it. Um, yeah, so it was so cool. And yeah, so that's pretty much my journey into, into tech, into coding, into mobile development. It's really weird. It's, yeah, it's not a, a path that most people would have to go through or I would recommend, but yeah, it was cool. Yeah, okay. All right, so let's let's back up a little bit um, into the the portion of your story when you were talking about kind of reevaluating what you wanted to do, right? You took the summer off after graduation to try and figure out like what were you going to do with your life. Um, if people are also considering a big career move, you know, don't you don't have to be fresh out of school to realize maybe this isn't the the area that you wanted to be in. Um, what do you think that people should evaluate before they're making like before they they make a big career move? And how did how did you, you know, utilize this to try and figure out what was your going to be your best path? Yeah, great question. Great question. Um, I would say definitely think about your finances, right? Um, if, if, if you're already like, if you already work or you already have a career or something like that, so definitely finances is one because it's general assembly do, do not recommend that you work a job while taking the class, right? Because like I said, it's so intense. What the schedule I was working, there was no way I can work another job while doing that, right? Um, putting in 16, 18 hours a day. There's no way. Um, so definitely try to figure out your finances, but also um, you need support as well, too, from the people around you, your friends and your family and those things, right? Um, fortunately for me, I had those things. So I was fresh out of college. During my college, during my high school years, college years, my mom was extremely supportive of me terms of anything I, I wanted to do so she never really like forced me or pressured me or even try to encourage me to get a job while still in school right mm -hmm. and then when I was when I graduated um she still like never got on me like okay it's time for you to get a job and start making money or helping out with or she never she was always like okay whatever you're doing I give you full trust that you're going to figure out whatever it is you need to figure out and yeah I will go from there so I was still living at home, took advantage of that, right? Um, so I didn't have to worry much about finances because I'm living at home. I don't have any bills or anything. And my mom is very supportive. She's not pressuring me to contribute to the household or anything like that. So I had those two things, right? Um, so I feel like those were the two biggest things that contribute to me making this decision. Um, yeah. So I would definitely think about your finances and think about the support that you have around you as well, too. And if because sometimes you need that, like that freedom and mental, like clarity and peace of mind to actually like delve into it so you can actually get the results that you want and it can all be worth it. Because if you're fighting every single day at home with your loved ones or whoever it is, then you're not in the right headspace to really capitalize because um, a program like General Assembly is only three months, but it's four years worth of college that's stuffed in three months of programming so it's mm -hmm. very very intense hence the word immersive right so you want to make sure that you capitalize on in the three months as much as you can with as much freedom and peace of mind and comfort and all those things so those would be the mm -hmm. two biggest i would say 
I, I mean, you make some really good points because, you know, having that, that support is so incredibly crucial. Nobody does this on their own, right? Even people that think they do, there's always some, somebody helping out in the background. Um, so yeah, I think it is really important to think in terms of, you know, do you have the time to dedicate to this and are you going to be able to, to support yourself? You know what I mean? Like, is this something that is sustainable for you? Um, okay. Yeah. So while you were, oh, go ahead, please. Yeah. Well, one last thing I was going to add is also, I guess, look at your schedule depending. So in my cohort, we had a couple of um, students. So I did it from, I did it around June. Right. So we had, I had a couple of college students in my, I was fresh out of college, but I had students that were current, um, currently in school at the time, but they were on their summer break. It's a three month program. So by the time it finished, it's time for them to go back to school, but they had the freedom where they don't have to worry about school and they weren't working or anything. So it made sense. So just figuring out your schedule and trying to find the right time and just plan around that three months as well too. So that, yeah, that's, that's a good hack as well too. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. So this see, oh, we do have a question from Demetrius in the chat here saying, do you recommend GA's full-time or part-time programs? Did you feel that your degree helped you with landing a job? All right. So let's talk about it. You went full-time. Do you know people that did, um, you know, a, like a part-time or a, a extended schedule? Um, no, well, I'm actually not even aware of the part-time offer that they have. That's probably new, but at the time I did general assembly, it was completely full-time for the three months. Like, you weren't, yeah, you shouldn't work a job. You couldn't work a job, even if you wanted to. Um, so yeah, we were all full-time for the three months. Yeah, I'm not even aware of the part-time. So, um, but for me, I think the full-time was definitely worth it. Um, like, because you're learning so much so fast that you can't be distracted by anything else. You have to be completely focused on that if you really want to get the results, especially coming from where I came from. Like I was a complete beginner no, yeah, be, yeah. right so unless you have some skills and you already know the fundamentals of programming or whatever course you're taking then maybe it's like okay i'm just trying to upskill a little bit but i'm not a newbie or anything like that then maybe you can try to manage it with other things but for me personally i couldn't so i had to completely commit myself to it 100 yeah yeah um, and I also like, I wanted to revisit what you had said earlier. So Demetrius, second question was, did you, do you feel like your degree helped you with landing a job? And I, I wanted to come back to what you'd said earlier about how your unique perspective being the, you know, the least, um, the least experienced one in the class with even just the, yeah. you know, the, the field of computer programming or computers, like that is, it's really cool because, you know, the idea that you didn't necessarily fit in with the rest of the group is what made you stand out like that that different perspective and having a different interest than maybe some of the other uh other, other students did really yeah. absolutely helps yeah yeah um, um to that question did my degree help me with landing a job so my degree was in accounting so the answer was no and no one asked me about if i had a because so here's a, here's the beauty about um, computer science and tech industry, which I fell in love with, right? No one really cares about what degree you have or what school you went to or anything like that, right? When you're interviewing for a job, they send you a co-test. Mm -hmm. If you can complete that co-test, they really don't care what school you went to, who you're connected with, or what degree you have or anything like that, how you learn how to code. None of that is relevant. They just want to know, can you do the job, right? And I've never experienced that in any other industry. And the freedom to, like, you don't have to wear any suits or anything like that, which perfectly fits my lifestyle. So I'm like, oh, yeah, this is amazing. I can just show up however I want, um, wear whatever I want. And, yeah, as long as I can do the job, then it speaks for itself. That's all that matters. Um, so that was one of the beauty about it. So, yeah, um, no one ever asked me about, um, what school I went to or did I complete my degree or anything like that, how I got into programming. No one cared about that. They just wanted to know, can you do what we need you to do? And that's all being tested through a code challenge, right? They give you um, something to do, um, give you a time frame to complete it, and you have to use specific technology tools and whatever the case is. And yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, let's talk about some of the challenges throughout the transition for you. Um, you know, we've, we've touched on the, the idea that you needed support for sure. 
Um, what were some of the other hurdles that that were part of this tra- making this transition for you? Um, hurdles in making the transition. Um, so I guess okay. One thing I did, I took a huge risk and I sacrificed a lot for this, right? So I was banking a lot on this. I'm like, okay, spent four years trying to attain this degree. Now I don't want it. I hate it actually. Um, so whatever I decide to do, I got to make sure this works, right? Um, I believe I had $2,000 in my bank account at the time. It was just savings, right? Because I never worked a job or anything. Um, and I needed a MacBook because when I found out about the, um, the General Assembly program, they said, we highly recommend you use a MacBook. You could use, um, um, what you call it, a Windows computer, but none of the instructors use windows. So the, 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 um, the amount that they will be able to help you in the class might be very limited. And knowing where I'm coming from, so I'm like, okay, if I'm a complete newbie, I don't wanna make it harder for myself. So I need a MacBook, right? And like I mentioned in the beginning, I hated computers, never liked them, never really used them, anything. Um, but once I committed to this, I was like, okay, then I need to take it serious and I need to do everything I can. So I ended up spending $1,500 for my, for my computer. Um, and I had $2,000 in the bank. So that other 500 was used for transportation to get to General Assembly every single day. Um, so I had to sacrifice a lot in terms of um, my social life, right? So the money, my five, the $500 was only for transportation and um, lunch sometimes. Lucky, luckily at the time, General Assembly, they had snacks and all the type of stuff on campus. And I think almost every Friday was happy hours. So they provide drinks and sometimes they'll bring pizza and all those things. So I get to, I, I got to capitalize on those things. I'm not even sure if they offer those things now. Um, but back then I feel like they was, they had so much money and everything like they were spending and doing a bunch of things. Right. Um, so I took advantage of those things. I ate all the snacks and free food and drinks and everything. Like I took advantage of it because I had to make this 500 last, right? Um, so those that was some challenge on the social side as well too. I somewhat, I pretty much I told my friends um, I'm not interested in going anywhere. I'm not interested in no events, anything. I'm sorry, birthdays, whatever it is, I'm gonna have to miss it. Even my girlfriend. Right. I told her, luckily, we had mutual friends. Right. My friends were also her friends. That's how we met. So I told her, go hang out with them for the summer because I can't hang out. I, I'm, I'm just not there mentally. And even if I wanted to, I just couldn't. Right. I couldn't find the time. I'm working 18 hours on this course a day. There's no time for me to hang out and do anything. Um, so, yeah. So there were some challenges and sacrifices that I had to make um, to make it work. And. I'm so happy and grateful that I actually did follow my gut, follow my instinct and trusted myself and yeah. Yeah, good for you. That's excellent. And it takes a lot of conviction, not only to to make the change, but to also like realize what you need to do to get yourself through the program and then make those changes, like, you know, actually right. do the things you need. That's, it's, it's never as easy as it sounds, right? Ever. Yeah. Um, all right, so a lot of the questions that we were getting from people, especially upon registration, um, were about experience needed, right? So this person had written in asking, do I need experience as a mobile developer to be considered for an entry level role? What other information could I showcase if I lack the experience? So let's talk about this. You know, If somebody doesn't have the professional experience for the role they're going after, do you think that, that entry level for mobile developers isn't really entry level? Do you think that entry level means like we want you to have two plus years experience? Um, yeah, from my experience, you need to have mobile development experience for a mobile development job, right? Because if you don't have any experience, you don't know how to code, you don't know how to write um, code for a mobile application, then what exactly are you going to do in that role? And <clears throat> unless you have some other skills that ties directly to mobile development, so maybe like if you do quality assurance or something like that, or you do debugging, um, but that still requires you to understand code. So even if you don't write code, you have to understand code. Um, so yeah, so to that question, um, I'm not sure if it's possible. I don't think so that it's possible for you to get an entry level mobile development job without have, having any mobile development experience. Um, 
Yeah, a lot of the question, I I kind of thought they were coming at it from a perspective of like they they learned the skills, but they don't have like a role on their resume where they've used it like you know to be paid for their skills. Um, so I think yeah, so like let's say let's say that's the case. If this person you know either has gone to a boot camp or has self taught, um, Mm -hmm. like do you what kind of skills should people be showing if they don't necessarily have like a boot camp certificate or you know something to show an employer saying hey yeah I know what I'm doing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think I misunderstood that. Um, great for clarifying that. Um, so like I mentioned, the good thing about tech, right? They don't really care what's, um, what education or training you had or whatever the case is, if you know how to code. And so as long as you can get that interview, if you can get them to offer you an interview, Mm -hmm. then that's fine. Now, in terms of what do you put on your resume? So if, if you're self-taught or you went to a boot camp, then you you did um, projects, right? Um, I think throughout the three months that I did General Assembly, we did four projects. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them was, uh, I think two of them was independent. The first two was independent and the third one was a collaborative um, project. And then the fourth one was my final project, which I did with the app. Um, so, and they highly encourage that you use those as your experience on, so you show that you have built stuff, um, you know how to code, here are some projects that I've worked on that I did. And then also, if you do a boot camp, at least specifically for general assembly, they had us, they, um, they taught us about how to utilize our LinkedIn account and all those things. And the number one thing I remember is that they made us um, list general assembly as work experience. Mm. So yeah, they made us list it twice. So it was under work experience and it was also under, um, education. So it can show like, okay, I, here is where I got my education from, but then also here is my work experience because we did Mm -hmm. projects together, even though I wasn't getting paid or anything like that. So, and that helps a lot as well too. Yeah. Um, so yes, I would, I would just hone in on the projects that you did. Um, and the things that you've built and just have a portfolio. So something that they can reference to see like, okay, this person does know how to code and they know how to do things. And now it's just a matter of, okay, if I send you this code challenge, can you complete it based off of what you've done before? So yeah, the, um, the prior work experience or prior education at a, a, at a accredited college or anything like that is not really necessary, at least from my personal experience and what I know, it was never relevant. Yeah. And there's, um, you know, Mary's chiming in in the chat thread saying that they've seen boot camps list the actual, they've seen boot campers list the actual boot camps as a job because people are mentors, they're teaching assistants, as well as leads or education assistants during the time that they're in the program. Um, so that is really important to know. Um, Mary had also asked, what kind of projects did you put on your resume or did you make available for people to look at when it comes to a portfolio? Um. So at the time, during the, during the program, I was putting every single thing that we worked on, right? Um, because you're going to have your GitHub account. And then, um, which is which to me, I think is more important as well, too, is showing consistency on your GitHub account or whatever platform that you use, right? Because most, most um, employers, they want to see that you're consistent and you're coding every single day you're learning so keep your github up to date as much as possible make at least one commit every single day even if it's the smallest thing right you can just write um you can write one word of code that changes um what you did last yesterday right so you did something yesterday you come back today and you can literally just add a letter or a symbol or whatever it is anything and then you push that commit to GitHub, right? Just to show that you did something. Um, definitely don't do that every single day because they can also check and see exactly what you committed, but just to keep the consistency going so you don't show any lapse or any break in between days. Like, okay, he went four or five days and didn't code at all. I wonder what happened there, right? You don't wanna give them the, the, the chance to think negatively about you. Like, is it because he didn't code for a whole week? Is it because he's just not passionate about it or whatever? You could have been sick, you could have been traveling or whatever the case is, but they wouldn't know that, right? And people are very judgmental sometimes. And if they see that gap, they're gonna start creating their own thoughts and own, um, um, 
perception of what they think is happening and you just don't want to put yourself in that position so if you can code even if it's just one thing and just commit it every single day and just show that consistent line that goes across every single day definitely do that yeah okay i like that information um all right this there so there a lot of people are having questions regarding interviewing right so let's talk about how people should be preparing for a technical interview um what what do you recommend if people are you know facing this and and need to know how to get ready um how to prepare for a technical interview um so there's a lot of um tools online there was when we were in general assembly they used to tell us about this um i can't remember the name of the website where you can go and there's a bunch of different questions and you can try to answer as much technical questions as possible some of them will ask you to build things or just write a couple of lines of code or whatever just understanding certain concepts and, and and those things right um so there's tools on online i can't remember the name of it that we used to use um so that's how i prepared for interviews right um if i didn't know i'm um, sometimes it's good to ask, like, if you know you're going to get the interview, they told you they're going to interview, you can ask them, like, oh, um, what exactly are we going to be covering? It might be a specific concept. Like, they might tell you, like, oh, um, we want to do, um, we want to focus on, um, like, data structuring or something like that. So you just focus on data structuring. You go and you, you do as much research and um, work on as much um, code challenges as possible that, um revolves around data structure right mm -hmm. um so if you can get some insight insights from them prior then that would help a lot too but if not then there's there's tools online um yeah i'm so sorry i can't remember the name it's been so long for me um right. yeah if you're able to think of it later we can always add it into the um the rewatch email when it goes out we can add in you know links or, or resources if you want to share those then so no yeah. worries um, no, I think that this is, you know, a really, this, this is really good advice here. Um, and I think it is really important that, you know, we recognize that not everybody has these opportunities. So I knew I'm, I'm seeing some, some chatter in here about, you know, people looking for opportunities in their area. Totally understand y'all, but thank you so much for sharing, um, some of your resource sharing that I'm seeing going on in the chat thread. I love, love, love to see this. So thank you so much y'all. Um, okay. So let's talk about people who are coming from a development uh, a development background to start with. Um, this person's question said, I'm coming from a regular web development background, but which skills should I focus on to learn mobile development? So if you're trying to move from web into mobile, do you think there are any things that, you know, um, coding languages or skills that you really, that would be the, the first thing or, or among the first things you should learn? Hmm. Okay, great question. Um, coming from web, transitioning into mobile, um, so you already know how to code. Um, so it depends, right? Because we have we have tools like React Native, right? So it's not native coding or anything like that. But so React Native, for anyone who may not know, is um, pretty much um, a language or a framework that came out. It was started by this guy that worked at Facebook, and um, he came up with this great way to build iOS and Android at the same time with one code base, right? Um, so going back to what I mentioned earlier, once I realized that I wanted to build mobile apps and I was in the wrong class, I started learning Objective-C, which is specifically only for iOS, right? So I don't know anything about Android. I've never built an Android app before. I don't know where to start or any of those things. but he came up with a cool way to write one code and you can build both platforms at the same time, right? Um, so which is why I don't code anymore because my co-founder, when he did um, General Assembly at that time, they introduced React Native. So he got a chance to get exposed to that and I wasn't, right? Um, so when he learned that, when we decided to start the business, since that made him more technical than, well, that was one of the things that made him more technical than I, than I was, right? Um, so we figured, okay, if you can build, if you can use React Native and build Android and iOS, then there's no need for me to try to build just iOS on the side. Then you can just build both of them and I'll take on a different role. 
So that's how I became the CEO. So my job is more on networking, fundraising, and business development, leadership, and those things. Um, so I haven't coded in a while. Um, but so that's how that happened, right? Um, so yeah, so you can either learn React Native. Um, which is a, or there's other um, similar tools as well to someone from Google came out with Flutter, pretty much does the same exact thing to build both um, platforms at the same time, one code base, or you can go the native route and learn that instead, which is more in demand, right? So I think React Native will give you a quick way, unless you want to, um, unless you know for sure that you want to specialize on one specific platform, like for me, I only cared about iOS. I had no interest in Android. I had an um, iPhone at the time. I still use iPhone now. So I had, I, I had no experience or no interest in Android. Um, so that's all I wanted to build. So for me, it made sense to just focus on the iOS specific language, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so unless you have a, a, a specialty that you want to focus on, then um, I would definitely say go in the native route so in this case, it would be if it's iOS, learn Swift, right? Um, Objective C is still available, but it's slowly getting pushed out. So I would start with Swift. It's easier to pick up anyways, and it's the newer one, and it's the one that Apple is supporting the most right now. So it makes sense to go with that one. Um, but yeah, but if you don't have a specialty and you're interested in doing both, then um, you can start with React Native. And then from there, you can easily transition if you want to like eventually get to a native. Or for Android, it's Java. So you could just jump straight into Java and just learn learn Java. Um, but yeah, so it's just about a matter of figuring out exactly what you want and what areas you want to focus in if you have a specific specialty. And then mm -hmm. you can go from there. Yeah, OK. Um, I do want to take this quick opportunity to remind everybody, if you are at all interested, you can sign up for a free information session about what a career change into UX design could do for you. Um, so I'm sharing the link here in the chat, Fred, just in case that link doesn't come up clickable. Apologies, y'all. I'll send just the link, uh, you know, in, uh, info separately. So hopefully that'll make it a little bit easier if y'all are trying to copy paste from the chat thread. Um, okay, one question I wanted to see if we had a chance to get to today. I know that um, General Assembly has a career coach support uh, where each boot camp student works with a career coach until they help you find your career in tech. Can you tell us what the outcomes program experience was like for you? So the outcomes experience was once again different for me. Um, yeah, I was just always in a weird, weird position. Man. It's so crazy, but I just always found a way to just make it work or figure it out, right? So like I mentioned, when I did General Assembly, there was no mobile development course, which is partially how I ended up in the wrong. The first reason was ignorance. I just didn't know any better. So I just got, I just know I wanted to go there. I want to get in. I want to learn how to code, but I didn't know there was a difference in coding. There's different languages. There's different platforms, all those things. I didn't know. So yes, it was just my ignorance and lack of not knowing what I'm getting myself into. So that was one. And then two, they didn't have any mobile development program at the time. So when I did, made that transition and started teaching myself mobile development, when I graduated, they told me, um, unfortunately, they wouldn't be able to support me with finding a job because they don't do mobile development and none of their employment partners offer any mobile development at the time because at the time General Assembly is only focused on web development, right? So all of the, um, the partnership deals that they have was of specifically around web development. But since I made that transition, I was pretty much on my own. So they couldn't help me, unfortunately. It's not their fault or anything, but I was left on my own to figure it out and try to find a job. And so I just started networking. I joined a bunch of um, iOS um, meetup groups. So if you guys are not familiar with meetup.com, great tool um, to find like-minded um, groups to be a part of. And so I joined all the iOS um, development groups you could possibly find in here in New York City. And I would go to them religiously, even on the weekends, I was there all the time just meeting people, I'm learning because so much people are more advanced than me. So I'm getting to learn and, but I'm also getting to meet other people as well too. And some of them, they work at Apple, Google, like everywhere you can think of, like you just name it, right? Um, 
So yeah, so just from networking, meeting people, tell them I'm currently looking for a job. And if they if their company is is hiring at the time, they're happy to put my name in or send me the application link or whatever the case is. So I just pretty much was on my own, but I hustled, I hustled, hustled my way. Excellent. Very, very cool. Good advice. And so thank you so much for sharing that there. Um, okay. We, I'm trying to work, work our way through questions here. So if y'all have questions, we've got 15 minutes left or a little less then. Um, so if you've got questions for Royden, make sure you send them in. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about what your, your career and your working life looks like now. Um, so as, as a tech innovator and a co-founder, um, you know, you are pr always constantly pushing yourself. Um, where do you think that, you, like, how do you, how do you think that you make that happen? How do you find ways to keep moving the, the needle forward? Okay. Um, so for one, I feel like I'm very self-motivated. Um, and I'm a very like determined person. And once I decide on something or I make my mind up, um, I'm going to go for it and I'm going to go all in. Same thing with when I graduated college, once I decided like, okay, I want to do this thing, I'm fully in it. Um, so with my everyday right now, even though I do miss coding, right? Um, I say it all the time, like me and my co-founder, we joke around I'm like, damn, I wish you were the one that had to switch because these networking events and fundraising, it can exhaust the hell out of you. Sorry for my language, um, but it's crazy. Um, but yeah, I would much rather be focused on our customers or our product and not so much having to go to a ton of meetings. And, and, and at nature, I'm an introvert as well too. So networking is not the easiest thing for me. It's super exhausting and yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. Like I've gotten much better now ever since I stepped into the CEO role for the company, but I was really, really bad back in the day. So. Uh, but if I'm determined for something, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and I'm going to push my fears aside or anything like that. So even with coding, right, um, like I mentioned, I joined a ton of iOS uh, meetup groups, even though I was super introverted, but I know this is what I want. So I can't think about my fears or my limitations or anything like that. I have to just get it done, just make it happen. Um, and I apply that same um, mindset to my current role today. So even though it's not the most ideal position for me because I would prefer to be coding, um, but I just keep that same mindset like, okay, this is what has to get done. And we decided to share the work amongst the two of us. So I'm just gonna go all in on it and try to do my best. So even though I don't fully enjoy it as much as coding, I, I'm, I can still tolerate it to a, to a degree and make it happen. Um, yeah, so, but in regards to my day to day, um, I do a lot of responding to emails, boring, right? Um, <laughs> uh, reaching out to investors or doing research to see, because right now we're fundraising. So a lot of my job is spent on Twitter and any other LinkedIn and just reading people bio and all these things to try to find like what's the right investor for us right now, like who invests in our market, who in invests in underrepresented founders, who invest in our industry or at our stage in business right now. Like, so just trying to figure out all those things and then reaching out to them, trying to set up meetings. And so my day-to-day -day is all around those things or going to networking event and try to meet people in person and follow up with them afterwards. And yeah, so that's what it looks like. Okay, I like that. Um, I do want to, uh... Uh, remind everybody, if you've got questions, please feel free to submit them. Um, I'm also going to keep sharing that link there in case y'all are interested in booking a, um, a free info session about um, career changes through General Assembly. So I'll keep sharing the link for that as well. Um, all right. So let's talk about some of the transferable skills. All right. So you came from accounting and you were transferring into um, development or into tech. What were some of the transferable skills that you think really helped um, enable you to to move from you know from accounting into the tech space? Mm, great question. Um, I would say a lot of the skills that really helped me were more, more like I don't know if you call that soft skills or intangible. So pretty much attention to detail, right? Because with accounting, so in accounting, so I had a specialty as well too, similar to programming. I was focused on iOS 
in accounting, I was primarily focused on taxes. So I did taxes for a little while as well, too. Um, while I was in college as well, we had a program where we were doing people's taxes for them for free. So you just come to come to the campus between the tax um, timeline, which is January to April, and we'll do your taxes for you. Um, so that was my specialty in terms of accounting. And with taxes, attention to detail is everything, right? Because if you input the wrong thing, you can that can cause someone to owe a ton of money in taxes and the government is going to come for you or you might end up um, getting them a refund that they don't deserve or they shouldn't be getting in the first place. And then that can become an issue as well, too. Um, or you can spell a, a child's name wrong and all of a sudden now the person don't qualify for this specific credit because they don't match up to what's in the government system and all those things. So attention to detail was very, very key. Right. And I feel like that was the biggest thing that helped me with coding because one error can mess up your entire code. Right. You can have a code base of like 20,000 um, lines of code. And it's not working because a period or a comma is in the wrong place or something like that. Your hand slipped and you pressed a, a letter by accident, you misspelled the word or something, and the entire app would break and not work because of that one little error, right? So having that ability to pay attention and focus on the, the minor details, I feel like that really, really helped me. So yeah, being super observant and, and attentive to details what I would say was key for me specifically. Yeah, I think that's a good one. And I like that you highlighted, you know, that certain soft skills are going to be key um, mm -hmm. because, you know, I feel like terming them soft skills sounds pejorative, right? It, it kind of yeah. discounts them, but like, these are the things that you learn by existing in the world, you know, just because you didn't take a course on it and get a grade doesn't mean that you, these are not valuable skills to have. Yeah, um, exactly. So yeah, very, very important to remember. Yeah. All right, we have a little bit, uh, a little less than, than three minutes ish left before we try and like to, you know, kind of wind things down. Um, let's see here if I've got any of the last questions that people want to ask here. There we go. All right, so let's talk. I feel like almost every every chat I've hosted in the last two to three weeks has been talking about AI. Obviously, this is something that is, you know, going to be a big deal and make a lot of waves in many different fields and industries. Um, what do you, what do you see on the horizon for web developers in, you know, in this age of AI? Do you think that there are ways that people can kind of future proof their careers within the development sphere? Um, this is really interesting, right? Um, there's a lot of talk right now that AI is going to replace a lot of developers because you have things like chat GPT that can create a whole website for you by you just telling it what you want and what you, how, how you want it to look and all those things, right? But um, there's a lot of things where developers are still needed, right? And it goes back to those deep lift minor details and um, updating and stuff like that too, right? So AI is not gonna be the most efficient at maintaining a code base. So it might be able to create a website for you, but in order to maintain it or to update it or whatever the case is, it's, it's, it's gonna be a, little, a bit more challenging in that regard. So um, developers are still gonna be needed. Um, personally, I don't think developers, it, like I feel like AI is, is, is gonna be used to supplement the work of developers and not necessarily replace them, right? Um, it might slow things down a bit in a sense, but I don't see it replacing developers. Um, yeah, it might, but it might supplement enough to the point where it's like, okay, instead of hiring 10 developers, I can hire five with this AI and still get the work done. Um, but there's always gonna be a need for actual developers in my personal opinion. Um, Thank you for yeah, sharing Did I that. answer some of the question? Yeah, yeah. No, I think that obviously none of us has a crystal ball, right? So none of us know what's going to happen with this. Um, but right. yeah, I mean, I think it is really important to remember that everybody's going to be scared to start with, right? Because it's new and it's going to make a lot of changes and we don't know what those are going to be. So I think that it is, you know, it's important and it is understandable to have that like healthy kind of 
you know, a like wait and see mentality. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is something that, you know, if this is going to, if this is going to take over, like we think it's going to, then it's something that we should be trying to integrate and use to our advantage as much, as much as we can. Um, yeah. because that way, you know, if, if that's where the future is headed, then having experience in that area is going to still keep you valuable and, you know, keep you marketable. So yeah, important information. Okay. So for our last five minutes, I want to turn the stage back over to you a little bit. If people only remember one thing from today's event, if they only take one thing with them, what do you want that one thing to be? Um, and majority of the audience are looking to get into programming or? Um, yeah, I would say that that's accurate. Okay. Um, so if the majority of them are looking to get into it, um, my biggest advice would be because it's different now compared to 2015, right? There's way more competition. There's way more tools that's out there to do a lot of things to make things so much easier, right? Um, so if you're really serious about this, um, you have to commit to it 100%. You can't, 95% is not going to work. I know that's a high percentage, but it got to be 100% or more. Right, um, you have to really take it serious. The competition is really high. Um, tech is hot and sexy and all that stuff right now. So everyone wants to get into it, right? So there's there's a lot more compared to when I was doing it. There wasn't that many interest in it at the time. It was starting to become popular. A lot of people know about it and everything, but it wasn't as popular and cool as it is now. So I think it's harder now. So that means you're gonna have to stand out even more. I got lucky. I feel like it was just, I don't know, serendipity or I, I, I don't know, but it just, everything just felt like it was falling in place to me in a sense. Um, and I, and I wouldn't bank on that even if I had to do it all over again. Um, but yeah, so definitely put in the work, commit to it, make sacrifices. Um, yeah, these are the things you have to do if you really, really want this and you're serious about it make the sacrifice, take the risks, believe in yourself, and it can happen. Because if I, I personally feel if I could learn how to code, anyone in the world can learn how to code because I did not know it. Like I said, I never even heard the term computer programming or coding or web development, any of that. I've never heard those terms ever. So I don't feel like there's a single person who is less experienced than I was at the time. And if I made it out, then I know for sure you can make it out too, for sure. But you just got to take it serious and you got to really commit to it and put in the work. Yeah. Absolutely. Excellent advice. Royden, thank you so, so much. It has been really wonderful to get to, to learn more about your career and what that has looked like and, and get a lot of your expertise and experience um, you know, from, from that journey. So thank you so much for sharing with us. No problem. Thank you. All right, y'all. I just want to remind y'all if you are curious I hope this at all. Was valuable to the audience. Oh God! I mean, truly, y'all. I mean, the the chat was bumping the whole time. I could tell that the audience was very, very much engaged. So thank you so much. Um, all right, y'all. If y'all are interested in learning more about General Assembly, or you want to set up a free information interview, or not information, sorry, a free uh, information uh, appointment, please feel free. Um, I I sent in, um, I, sh I forwarded the links for all of this, but I'm going to share it again here in the chat. There we go. Um, I also do want to say a huge thank you to everybody that was in the chat here um, sharing other links and resources that they have discovered. Um, Mary was absolutely crushing it. I saw a ton of those links come through from you, Mary. So thank you so much. Um, I really, really love seeing all the interaction that y'all have on these events. So thank you again to all of our audience members. Um, whether you joined us in our Zoom uh, room live, you tuned into the YouTube live stream, or you're watching this in the future, at which point. Hi, from the past. Um, you know, I'm just so glad that you all joined us today. You have just taken an hour out of your day to do something positive for yourself and your career. That is not an easy feat in this day and age. So I just want um, and hope that y'all will congratulate yourselves on that. And if this was your first Power to Fly event, I sincerely hope it will not be your last. We can't wait to see you on another Power to Fly event soon. Have a good night, y'all. Bye. Thank you.